Well, if y'all would turn with me today to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 21 today. Genesis chapter 50, 15 through 21. Now raise your hand if you have ever been hurt by someone. Okay, everybody's hand should be up. Have you ever been hurt by family? Have you ever been hurt by friends? Have you ever been hurt by the church? That's a lot of hurt. That is a lot of hurt. Well, here's the next question. You don't have to raise your hand on this, but deal with this in your heart. Have you forgiven them? Have you forgiven that family member, that friend, that brother or sister in Christ that has sinned against you? Or have you taken revenge for paying evil for evil? Have you ever hurt others? I think the answer is yes. We have all hurt others. We've all been hurt by people. You know, forgiveness is really at the core of Christianity. It's at the core. And we absolutely love the forgiveness of God. We love to be forgiven ourselves. But forgiving others can be difficult. And many of us have experienced great hurts in our life. Now, if you look to the world, or if you look to your own flesh, you'll likely find a justification for hating somebody, for taking revenge upon somebody. But Christians, we are called to be different. We are called to forgive. So what is the key to forgiving? Well, the key to forgiving is knowing God. The key to forgiving is knowing God. It's knowing Him intellectually. That is, knowing who He is as He has revealed Himself in His Word. And it's knowing God experientially. That is, in your life you have experienced God's mercy. In your life you've experienced God's forgiveness. And in your life you've experienced the sovereignty of God. You see that God's hand has been upon you no matter what you went through. That even when men meant something for evil, God meant it for good. That He works all things for good to those who love Him. To those who are called according to His purpose. Knowing God is the key to forgiving others. Genesis 50, 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before your father died... He commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the example of Joseph. I thank you for the example of Christ and what it is to forgive others. For Lord, in this life we have experienced many hurts. And it is so natural to want to take revenge upon others that hurt us. But you have called us to a higher standard in this world. You have called us to forgive. You have called us to show mercy. And Father, we thank you that your hand is always upon us. Even when the world seems out of control, you are still on your throne, Lord. 
You still rule. And Father, I pray that we would just rest in Your sovereign hand. And that today, whatever it is, the hurts we may be carrying, maybe it is someone we have not forgiven, Father, I pray that You'd bring reconciliation today and that Your name would be honored in all that we do. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The story of Joseph and his brothers. We see in the beginning of this passage the lingering effects of sin. The lingering effects of guilt for sin. For Joseph's brothers had done evil against him. They had sinned against him. What did they do? Well, they were jealous of Joseph. They were angry at Joseph. And they at first plotted to kill him. But eventually they threw him down in a hole. And then they sold him into slavery. Now this was when Joseph was probably about 17 years old. And as far as they knew, Joseph was dead. Until he revealed himself as being in second command in Egypt. God sovereignly working through Joseph's life. And now here we are 39 years later and the brothers still have guilt. They're worried. They had at least worldly sorrow that we see at the beginning here. That is, they feared the repercussions of their actions. They feared man. Now why was that? Well, it's because they were guilty and their father, Jacob, was now dead. Now these brothers... They did not deserve forgiveness, but Joseph had forgiven them. If you look earlier in Genesis, when Joseph first revealed himself to his brothers, he said this, But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. How could Joseph have this perspective on the situation? Well, see, he knew God. He knew God's mercy. He knew God's forgiveness. And he knew God's sovereign control of all things. He had told them. He forgave them. Don't hold it against yourself. God is working good out of this situation. And they all come to Egypt, but now their father, Jacob, is dead. Now, if Jacob was the only barrier in place that was keeping Joseph from taking revenge, we could say that Joseph really hadn't forgiven them. But we see that he really had forgiven them. The world, the values of the world, the values of our flesh, would say that Joseph would absolutely be justified in hating his brothers. And see, that's what they think in this first verse, in verse 15. They say that perhaps... Joseph will hate us. That's the world's way to hate, to take revenge. And you've probably experienced in your own life someone who says they have forgiven you, but then they turn around and hold it against you again. You see, the reality is people may turn on you, but God is different. You see, His forgiveness, He cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. He remembers our sins no more. Our sins are washed away. This is what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. God the Son in the flesh. So we turn to Him and we are forgiven of all of our sins. We never have to wonder if God will receive us. Because when we've turned to Christ, all of our sins are forgiven. And we are given the righteousness, the holy standing of Jesus Christ. And God who has forgiven us much, has commanded us to forgive others. You see, we are to forgive others even if our brother or sister repents. That's the best, that's the best situation. If they repent, if they turn from their sin, and you can have a reconciliation, a new relationship with that person. That's great. But we're also to forgive even if our brother or sister refuses to repent. That is, they refuse to admit they're wrong. We are to forgive others, even if they are just flat out an enemy. You see, this forgiveness that God has called us to is going to look different with different relationships. It's according to how the other person responds as well. But all forgiveness has this in common. All forgiveness 
involves us giving that person to God and not taking revenge. And you see, we often think about revenge in just outward actions. But revenge can be in words and thoughts and this burning bitterness that we hold on to against others. See, God has called us to forgive. Give that person to God. Allow God to judge them. Allow God to deal with them. A gr the greatest barrier probably to forgiving is hate. And again, that's what his brothers were worried about. For hate manifests itself in revenge, in hurting others again. But see, Scripture tells us, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. When you've been hurt, maybe you have anger at that sin, but don't let the day end without dealing with with that anger. Allow that anger to have its proper place. And don't give place to the devil. For when we do not deal with that hurt, we're going to become bitter. And we're going to act out in the way of the devil rather than in the way of God. Jesus goes further and says it this way, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Is that how the world acts? What are we to do? We're to love our enemies. We're to bless those who curse us. We're to do good to those who hate us. We're to pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Are you doing that? Have you responded in that way? Why should we do that? Jesus says that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. See, God is our example. God blesses all people. What are we to do? Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? In other words, does, doesn't the world, look at it, the world loves those who love them. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, Jesus says, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is a high standard. This is the standard that God always has. It is holiness. It is obedience to His Word. It is, is to follow Him. Paul takes it further in the book of Romans. He says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. What does it mean to give place to wrath? That is, give it to God. Allow God to be the judge. Don't avenge yourself. Do not pay, repay evil for evil. He says, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That's a promise from the Lord. Vengeance belongs to Him and He will repay. And it goes on, it says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty... Give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. That's very different than the world, isn't it? If your enemy's hungry, you feed them. Thirsty, you give them a drink. And what is this heaping coals of fire on their head? Well, it was an Egyptian practice to carry a pan of coals on your head to show public remorse for a sin that you have committed. You're carrying the shame and guilt on your head. So in other words, when we love our enemies, when we bless those who curse us, when we pray for those who spitefully use us, when we're really killing them with kindness, as the phrase goes, we're putting these burning coals on their head. We're bringing shame upon them. You see, Joseph 
He knew God. He practiced holiness. He blessed His enemies. He forgave His brothers. And we see this lingering effect of guilt that his brothers had. We could absolutely say that Joseph has heaped coals of fire on their heads. He's been good to them. He's blessed them already. And they have this guilt, this shame. And out of fear, they send messengers to Joseph. Now it's not clear if their father Jacob really said this or not. Scripture does not tell us for sure. But this is what he says in... Verse 17, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. This could have been a message from Jacob, their father. For Jacob understood the fear of revenge. You see, he had stolen the birthright of his brother Esau. And when he was going to reunite with Esau, he was worried about revenge. He would understand. And perhaps this is a message from their father. Please forgive them of their evil. Don't miss that. The brothers knew they had done evil against Joseph. Their father knew they had done evil against him. It says forgive their trespasses. What, is, what are trespasses? Well, it's rebellion, but it's a breach of trust. Do you think that they had a breach of trust with Joseph? Even with Jacob as well, as they sold their brother into slavery. And I thought this was interesting too in this message. He calls the brothers servants of God. They knew God too. They were brothers to Joseph in another way not just by flesh, but by spirit as well. And that's a unique relationship we have with other believers. And we see the response to Joseph in this message. His heart is tender. You know, that's been a long time since his brothers hurt him. But his heart is tender, not calloused. His heart is sensitive to God. And I think we get a warning out of this and an example as well. If you're not dealing with the hurt in your heart, if you're not giving that person to God, your heart is going to become hard. Your heart is going to become bitter. And you're not going to be sensitive to the situation. You're not going to be compassionate. You're not going to be merciful if your heart is hardened. We need to forgive. Joseph really... He was probably saddened by his brother's reactions. You see, sin continues to bring hurt, even long after forgiveness. You realize that? Sin continues to bring hurt even long after forgiveness. It's lingering effects of guilt and shame. And really we see with the brothers here a problem that we can have with ourselves. They could not forgive themselves. They were worried. They had done an evil against their brother. And Joseph weeps. Now perhaps they were comforted by Joseph's reaction, knowing that maybe they could come to him now. Or maybe they were convicted at him weeping over the message. Whatever the situation, they approached Joseph. Their guilt had overwhelmed them. So maybe they had worldly sorrow at the beginning. They were just worried about punishment. But godly sorrow. Truly being sorry for your sin, your sin that has offended holy God, they fail at the mercy of their brother. Now don't miss this. The servants of God repenting. You see, they were not just expecting forgiveness, they repented. You know, when we're talking about forgiving, let's remember that we too can be those that hurt others. If we have sinned against someone, we need to ask for forgiveness. Don't wait on them to come to you. Deal with it. Have sorrow. They asked for forgiveness. And they really fulfilled the dreams of Joseph here. You see, Joseph had a dream when he was 17 years old. Two dreams. And it showed that his brothers and his father would bow to him one day. And this angered the brothers greatly. 
And no doubt this led to them selling him into slavery, wanting to kill him. They were angered at these dreams, but what are they doing here? They are bowing down before Joseph. Now if you look at the account, this is actually the fourth time they bow before Joseph. But the first three times, they did not know it was Joseph. They just thought he was an Egyptian. Now they know. This is their brother. And they will, willingly bow before him. See, they're guilty. They were guilty of selling Joseph into slavery, and now they offered themselves as slaves to Joseph. They fell at his mercy. But Joseph gives them words of comfort. Do not be afraid. He showed them mercy. Mercy like God had shown Joseph over and over again. For God had never left nor forsaken Joseph. You see, even when Joseph was in slavery, God showed him mercy. When he was in Potiphar's house, God showed him mercy. When he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, God showed him mercy. When he was in prison, God showed him mercy. When the cupbearer forgot to ask for uh, Joseph's pardon, God showed him mercy. And when he was there, second in command, under Pharaoh, God showed him mercy. He understood this experientially. And he's showing mercy to his brothers. And he basically says here, am I to judge? Verse 19, do not be afraid for am I in the place of of God. He says, am I one to condemn? Am I one to punish? Am I one to take revenge? Do you remember God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He knew, he knew that God is a just judge. And as a just judge, he will condemn those that are guilty. He will punish those who are guilty. He will take revenge. You see, it's God's prerogative to judge sin. And He will. He will either judge sin on our own account or on the account of Christ. You see, we're going to be either found guilty of our sins or we're going to be found innocent because Jesus has taken our sins upon Him. So it is God's prerogative to judge. But is it right for us ever to judge? If you actually get into Scripture, you find that God has given authority of judgment and punishment to three orders for sure. The government, He's given them the sword, the ability to carry out capital punishment, the ability to punish people for their crimes. He's also given authority to the church. For church discipline, you have to be able to judge the situation to carry out discipline. And He's given authority to parents to whip their children, to correct their children, to punish their children, to give them direction. But see, here's the thing that God has not given us. He has not given us the individual right of eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that's by the first century, that's what the Jewish people had interpreted. But see, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is talking about justice. That is, the government, when they're punishing someone, they should not go beyond what the crime was in this punishment. But for us as individuals, we should not be taking revenge. But here's an interesting angle for this situation. Joseph was in the government. He possibly had the authority to punish them. He had already put a brother in prison. As an example, before this case, he had the authority to punish them. But he submitted to God. He was giving his brothers to God and not taking revenge. You see, God will judge. And he knows if a person's repentance is real. And God will repay. And Joseph trusted God. And that's what we have to do. And all our hurts is we have to trust God. Give that person to God. Now in verse 20, probably the most famous passage in the account of Joseph. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. I want you to note that Joseph did not ignore the truth. He said, brothers, 
I know you meant this for evil. You remember at the beginning, the brothers said, we've done evil against Him. And then Jacob said, they've done evil against you. And now Joseph admits, they've done evil. He's not like, that was great. I'm glad y'all did that. No, it was evil. You did evil against me. But God meant it for good. You see, Joseph is sensitive to God's providence. That is his sovereign, supreme rule over all things, that God is in control. He never left Joseph. And he providentially controlled all of the situations, all of the circumstances. God was with Joseph. Now this quote here, I was actually talking to Mr. Jimmy Banks last week about what I was preaching on this Sunday. And if you've ever been to Mr. Jimmy's class or just talked to him, you've probably heard some of his nuggets of wisdom. But here's a nugget of wisdom from Mr. Jimmy Banks. If God has His hand on you, man cannot put you low enough that God cannot reach you. Think about that. If God has His hand on you, man cannot put you low enough that God cannot reach you. Joseph trusted God. Through the betrayals, through the trials, through the suffering, through the hurt, God was with him. For God works all things for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God does bless all people, but the end of all people is not good. I want you to understand that. God blesses all people in many ways, but the end of all people is not good. There are people that are going to hell. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you are going to hell. See, God blesses all people, but the end is not good for all people. He works all things for good to those who love Him. Who is it that loves God? Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And He has commanded that we love our enemies. He has commanded that we forgive others. Those who love Him are those who are saved. And He works good in our lives in many ways. And in many things. You can see it through the life of Joseph. But ultimately, this is what God is doing through every situation, good or bad. He's making you into the image of Jesus Christ. He's making you a holy person. Person, He is shaping your character through everything you're going through. Look back at Joseph. When he was 17 years old, he was definitely immature. He didn't think before he spoke. He was maybe a little bit proud about the dreams he had. But now we have Joseph many years later. He trusted God. He was humble. And he forgave his brothers. You see, he recognized that God is the hero of the story. What was meant for evil, God meant for good. God overturned evil actions to save many people. How is it that He saved people? Well, they were starving, in famine, and He placed Joseph right where he needed to be to rescue his own family. You see, God uses the evil choices of man to still accomplish His purposes. He moved Joseph right into the place that He meant for him to be. And wherever you are, God has moved you there. What is the purpose? What is God doing? Maybe right now you're in slavery and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get out of prison. Maybe you've been falsely accused. But God has placed you where He's placed you for a purpose. To work all things for good. And what He did with Joseph is He rescued Joseph's family. And that has great significance for you. Because one of his brothers is Judah. Judah. And from the tribe of Judah came King David. And from the tribe of Judah came Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You see, this could have been the end of Israel. They would have starved to death. But God used what those men meant for evil. He made good come out of it. And the clearest example of God using evil to bring about good, to save people, is the cross. The clearest example of God using evil to bring about good is the cross. How terrible it is to think an innocent man, God the Son in the flesh, Jesus Christ, was betrayed by His brethren, the Jewish people, 
He was murdered by the Romans. But what man meant for evil, God meant for good, to save people. You see, Jesus came to give His life as a ransom for many. Let us consider the cross and the forgiveness of God. For we are all guilty sinners. We have all trespassed, sinned against God. We are in rebellion to our Creator. We do not deserve His forgiveness. And as a just judge, He is right in punishing us. But if we recognize our guilt, admit that we are sinners, and fall at the mercy of the King of kings, we find forgiveness. Just like Joseph's brothers found forgiveness that day at falling to His mercy. You see, the punishment has been paid. Jesus has paid it all. He takes all of our guilt and all of our shame that we can have eternal life. Now, if you know God's forgiveness, consider your forgiveness of others. In the parable that Jesus tells of the unforgiving servant, He gives us this understanding of God's forgiveness versus our forgiveness. There was a king who was going to collect all the debts that were owed to him. And he comes to this first servant who owed a tremendous amount of money, more money than he could ever repay. And the king is ready to throw him into prison. But this first servant begs for mercy. And the king forgives him. But then that first servant goes out. And he finds a second servant who owes him, who owes the first servant, about three months worth of wages. That's still serious. It's still a serious hurt and offense to the servant. But the second servant begins to beg for mercy. But instead, the first servant grabs him by the throat, begins to choke him and throws him into prison. The other servants see what happens. And they go to the king because they're grieved about it. And that king says to the first servant, You wicked servant. You wicked servant, I forgave you all this. Yet you are not willing to forgive your brother. This parable speaks to us. God has forgiven us of a debt that we could never, never pay on our own. And now we're called to forgive others. It's still a great hurt. It can still be a great debt against us. But it's nothing compared to what God has forgiven us of. You see, God demonstrated forgiveness for us. He has commanded us to forgive and He is honored when we forgive others. God is the reason we should forgive. But we must know Him. We must know Him like Joseph knew Him. Know His mercy, know His forgiveness, and know that He is in control. In verse 21, we see that Joseph again comforts his brothers. Do not be afraid. I will provide for your family. And he spoke kindly to them. You see, this forgiveness was shown in action. Very much like faith is shown in works. For what's on the inside will come out. So as you consider those who have hurt you, what is on the inside? Check your actions. How have you responded? So what is the key to forgiving? It's knowing God. It's knowing God intellectually. That is knowing who He is and what He has done. And it's knowing Him experientially in His life when He's shown you mercy. When He's shown you forgiveness. When you see that God is in control. He's never leave, left you nor forsaken you. Do you know God's forgiveness? And if so, have you forgiven others? Or have you taken revenge? Are you plotting revenge? Have you hurt others? What are you going to do about it? You see, there's only two choices. Honor God or dishonor God. We honor God when we forgive. We dishonor God when we are unforgiving. Father, I thank You for Your Word today. And the great challenge it is to us. There are many, many hurts in this life. And Father, I know there are many here that have been hurt by loved ones, by family members, been hurt by close friends, and been hurt by the church, Lord. 
Father, I thank You that Your forgiveness, that Your forgiveness is absolute, Lord. That You cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. That You remember them no more. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That as we turn to Christ, we find forgiveness. We find mercy. Father, I pray that we would not forget what You have done for us. For knowing You is how we are able to forgive others, Lord. You empower us to forgive. You have commanded us to forgive. And we know that You work all things for good to those who love You. As we look at our situation and think about the many hurts and the repercussions of that, those actions, Lord, help us to realize that You're still in control. You have a purpose for where we are today and what You've called us to. And Lord, I pray that we would rise to the occasion and that Your name would be honored and that You'd bring healing to our hearts. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.